Okay, so this is a, a video to follow on from the introduction to the generic mass spectrometer. So we're just going to go through and, and look through different types of mass spectrometer in this um, video and see uh, what kind the main of things that characterize the one mass spectrometer from another is really these uh, the way that the, the samples are ionized um, and to a certain extent the way that they're discriminated against the, the, the heavy versus the light ions. Um, to a large extent the ion detections are quite similar between mass spectrometers. You either have a, a, a secondary ion, um, no, sorry, sorry, not a secondary ion, a, um, uh, an ion counter or a Faraday collector. Um, so it's really we're looking at differences in the ionization. So there are lots of ways of ionizing ions. Um, many, many, many different types of mass spectrometer available uh, for all kinds of different applications. Um, but the ones we're going to be looking at uh, that are most common in the geological sciences uh, are these four here. So there's electron impact, um, secondary ionization, mass spectrometry, thermal ionization, and uh, inductively coupled plasma. So we're going to look at those kind of in turn and uh, describe or give some examples of where they might be useful to uh, a geoscientist. So electron impact ionization, uh, sometimes referred to as gas source ionization. So this requires your sample to be in a gaseous phase. Um, and that can either be a kind of like a gas of, of molecules of, of, of your sample. So you don't have to have formed kind of a gas of, of atoms. Uh, or it can be kind of like an atomic gas. So I mean, for instance, if you've just got, you know, if you, um, for instance, argon, if you've, if you've taken your rock and you've heated it up and you've kind of like let all the argon escape out of that rock, then that's just the atomic argon. Or, but quite often you're looking at a, a molecule that's given off. Um, and then what happens is that your molecule, okay, is, is then inserted into some kind of chamber inside the mass spectrometer. Uh, and then a beam of electrons is kind of like uh, passed through that chamber. And those electrons knock off other electrons from that molecule and form a positive ion of that um, of that molecule. Um, so this is um, not all that can happen. So there are some cases where if you have say a molecule like this and you bombard it with high energy electrons that can actually start to break apart the molecule. Okay so this can either be a good thing or a bad thing. So if, you, if you're actually interested in just measuring the amount of that molecule then that's not great because you're breaking it apart and, and turning it into something else. But sometimes uh, this can be quite useful if you're looking at particularly large organic molecules. This technique can be used to break up those molecules into smaller parts, which allow you to investigate kind of the, the constituent parts of your larger molecules, which is kind of like quite interesting. Um, so uh, just to kind of reiterate, you must have a sample that's a gas. So sometimes this can be used uh, if you're if you're actually sampling gases, either kind of dissolve gases from kind of like waters or things like that and you can dissolve the gases out into your mass spectrometer or um, more commonly in the geological sciences you've got some kind of uh, mineral or rock uh, and you do something to that to turn it into a gas so for instance with calcium carbonate you might dissolve that in an acid and give off CO2 if you're looking at noble gases for instance argon in a, in a rock you might heat up that rock and it might kind of give off um, its argon trapped inside the minerals Okay, so it's it's um, uh, other advantage of this 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 kind of source is that once you've made that gas, the um, the stability of the source is is very high. So you do get a very stable signal over time. So this is quite a good uh, type of source for measuring very precise isotope ratios. Um, so here are some examples of of, of the kind of uh, geological problems that uh, we can apply. Uh, gas source or electron impact ionization mass spectrometry. Um, so argon argon dating or potassium argon dating, when we're measuring the argon, we would ionize that with an electron impact source. Similarly, looking at some of the noble gases maybe dissolved in, in, in seawater samples, we might be able to measure those with uh, electron impact ionization mass spectrometry. Um, and, and a big application, particularly in paleoclimate, is the analysis of carbonate fossils. In this case, this is a benthic foraminifera. We add acid to that, we produce CO2, and that can tell us about, if we measure that CO2 molecule, we can work out what the oxygen and the carbon isotopes in that molecule are, and they are useful kinds of proxies for past environmental conditions.
So this is a, an example of, of, of one of the types of mass spectrometers that, that uses electron impact ionization. So this is a this is a stable isotope mass spectrometer for measuring carbonate samples. So this 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 part of the uh, the machine over here. This is a uh, I should probably say instrument. Mass spectrometers don't like their machines being called machines. They prefer instruments. Uh, so this is the, the mass spectrometer. Uh, uh, this is the sample preparation system. So this, we put our in this case, we put samples into individual vials. We add a little bit of acid into those vials, and we kind of then extract the CO2 into this, this volume here. The reason why we have this big cylinder of liquid nitrogen over here is that when, when you react carbonate with acid, you also produce water. Uh, uh, we want to remove that water. We don't want to measure that water. So we basically freeze out the water using liquid nitrogen. Uh, and we take our gas. Uh, into the mass spectrometer then where it can be ionized in the source region using this electron impact system. Just to point out that there are other types of ways you can introduce the sample, so you don't have to have individual vials like this. You can, in fact, just use a common acid bath and every time you want to measure a sample you just get your sample that's kind of a carbonate powder, you dump it into the acid and then put the CO2 into this chamber above the acid and then extract it one by one and then put the next sample in. That goes to the mass spectrometer. And another feature of this system uh, is, well, I think with almost all mass spectrometry, what, what isotope geochemists are really bad at doing is actually measuring real isotope ratios. Uh, what we can do instead of measuring kind of the, the actual ratio in the sample, we can measure some ratio that, that may be slightly fractionated or maybe slightly different to the actual ratio in the sample. But if we measure a sample and then we also then measure a, a reference gas which has got some CO2 in it that we know the isotope ratio in very very accurately and this is this cylinder down here on the, on the, the actual mass spectrometer. If we measure this the thing that we know and we put that in our mass spectrometer and then measure something that we don't know and then we, we do alternate one and then the other that allows us to correct our measured isotope ratio for um, any isotope changes that happen during these processes that go on in the mass spectrometer. And we'll come on to that uh, later in the, in the data processing video. So I guess uh, I should just point out it's not just uh, carbonate or, or rock samples that are used, uh, that, are, that are analyzed by electron impact ionization or gas source mass spectrometry. There are other methods of, of introducing samples into a mass spectrometer. Um, this is an example that's uh, quite often used in organic geochemistry uh, where we want to introduce either a gas uh, or sometimes, uh, so this is called gas chromatography, uh, there's alternative methods which are very similar where you've got a, a, a maybe a liquid that's got lots of organic molecules in you're interested in, um, that's called uh, high performance liquid chromatography and basically you have a very long tube that has got some kind of like magic coating on the inside and as you pass your sample either a gas or, or, a, or a liquid along the sample, different molecules preferentially stick to this surface. So the sample, the, the types of molecule that stick the least to the surface, they as you pass them along the tube, so this is a kind of a schematic of this long tube here, as they pass along the tube, okay, the ones that are, in this case, these yellow molecules, these stick the least to the, the outside of this coating. They kind of like pass through the tube first and then will come out at the end into our mass spectrometer. Sorry for the, I presume, Polish. Um, so this is a way of separating out individual organic molecules, okay, and then you can then introduce a kind of essentially one type of molecule at a time into the mass spectrometer. So from a, from a sample that's, say, you've extracted all of the organic um, compounds from a sediment, you can then interrogate each one of those organic compounds in turn for its isotope composition, okay? And this is... This, this, this process of chromatography is very similar to this thing where you might have done at school where you put a, a dot of ink on a piece of paper and then left it in a glass of water and it separates out all the different colours. So that's all this, this thing here is doing. It's separating out all of the different organic molecules. And if your, your sample is a gas, you might use gas chromatography um, or you might use a different system called high-performance liquid chromatography if you have uh, a liquid sample. Uh, another type of introducing way of introducing samples into into a, into one of these uh, gas source mass spectrometers that's quite uh, often used in organic geochemistry is if you're just interested in the bulk carbon content or the bulk isotope composition of carbon or the bulk hydrogen um, composition of 
of uh, hydrogen associated with organic matter or again nitrogen you can use one of these things that's um, that's commonly called an elemental analyzer where you take your sample and you basically pass it through a series of different kind of reaction vessels or furnaces which variously oxidize or reduce the sample uh, and then sequentially release all of the carbon all of the hydrogen and all of the nitrogen and then pass those can pass those through a gas chromatograph if you want to um, or not and then those then go one by one into the mass spectrometer so you can then measure the carbon isotopes or the hydrogen isotopes or the nitrogen isotopes of your samples again bracketing each of the samples with kind of measurements of nitrogen or carbon dioxide or uh, hydrogen gas if you're kind of measuring those things okay so to, to standardize your measurements and that will be covered in the, the data processing uh, lecture video Okay, so the next, um, the next kind of source uh, we're going to talk about is uh, thermal ionization. So this is, a, this is a way of producing ions of, of your sample by just making the sample very, very hot. So if you, if you increase the temperature of your kind of sample atoms uh, to very, very high temperatures, so thousands of, of degrees Kelvin, uh, they'll eventually just start losing uh, electrons from their outer shell due to them just having a very, very high energy. Um, so what typically you do, you have, so this, this, kind, of, this kind of thing, so this is maybe a, a, a ribbon of, of metal that's maybe one millimeter wide, and you pass an electric current through this, and that heats up very much in the same way as uh, an old fashioned light bulb might heat up and give off uh, light. Okay, so uh, you do that, uh, and the, what you've got to do to do this is you've got to put your sample on that metal filament. Um, so this means that you've got to reduce the volume of your sample down to a very, very small volume. Okay, so this is um, uh, quite analytically challenging, uh, okay, because if you just kind of dissolve up a rock and start to, to dry down that solution that you've dissolved up, you, you'll find that you'll start to crystallize out big crystals um, of salts. Okay, which will stop you getting down to this very, very small volume of sample. So one of the things we need to do is we need to chemically remove all of the elements that we're not interested in measuring before we, we try and put our sample on our thermal ionization filament. Uh, I can just point out that, that actually this, this process of thermal ionization is actually really inefficient. Okay, so as you heat up the sample, actually most of the, the sample are, uh, atoms will actually kind of evaporate off this filament without being ionized. Um, so there have been improvements to this technique where you where you have secondary filaments at the side of your your main filament, and you heat these up at the same time, and these give off uh, electrons as they heat up, much in the same way as if there was a sample there, except you're just you're just basically ionizing. You're making the metal so hot that it, it starts to ionize and, and give off. Um, uh, electrons and ions of itself um, and <clears throat> and this basically creates a, a, a flow of electrons across the surface of your your sample here which aids the ionization much in this in very similar way to the electron impact ionization okay so this can improve the efficiency um, you can you can have many of these samples on a on a wheel so you basically rather than just put one of these things inside your mass spectrometer you have many of them because once you've put the sample on, you need to put this thing inside the mass spectrometer, and the mass spectrometer to work must be at a very high vacuum. Um, so to, to avoid having to, to break that vacuum and pump down, which takes a long time, every time you want to change sample, we have this kind of rosette of samples. Um, so this is, this is, again, this is can be a very, very stable source of ions. So it's very good for measuring isotope ratios. Um, it's not very good for measuring multiple different elements because you have to remove most of the elements you're not interested in, okay, um, to get down to this very small volume. So it's usually only used for measuring one element at a time um, because it's the, the efficiency of the ionization is very, very sensitive to contamination from other elements, okay. And also, some elements just, it's really hard to ionize this way, so it's not good for, for everything. So just to touch on that a little bit more, so this is a this over here on the left is is a kind of a graph of the uh, first ionization energy. So thermal ionization energy is very not so good for measuring elements over here, which have high 
ionization energies, but for elements like uh, strontium, calcium, uh, uh, and to a certain extent the, the rare earth elements, these have got lower uh, ionization energies, so they are uh, more suitable for measurement by thermal ionization mass spectrometry. Okay, so quite often, so the isotopes of strontium, the isotopes of neodymium are, are, are quite often measured by thermal ionization. Okay. And this thing over on the right is just to show what are the methods we use to separate out all of the other elements from the element we're interested in. So we might, uh, so this is a, a, a chromato chromatography, these are chromatography columns. Um, so these work in, in much the same way as the gas chromatograph or a liquid chromatograph. So we get our sample, we dissolve up our rock, we put it in this kind of beaker at the top. And then as it flows down through this column, which is filled up with effectively very expensive plastic sand, um, different elements fall out at the bottom at different times, uh, or if we add different acids to flush through different, different elements. Okay, and this, I think this is an example of separating out titanium, and you can see that the titanium is kind of caught in the sample in this region, then all the other elements will be washed out at the bottom, so we don't need them, and then we can change the acid to something else that washes the titanium off. So we use this to isolate the element we're interested in before we then dry it down to a very, very small drop to put onto our thermal filament to be ionized and go into the mass spectrometer. And this is an example of one of the, the latest generation um, thermal ionization mass spectrometers. So you can see here that this is our, our basically our, our sample wheel. So each one of these little chambers has a sample dried down onto one of these very, very small filaments. And we can then rotate this into position over here. Um, and then when we're ready to measure that sample, we can kind of accelerate the ions along the flight tube here into the region where the magnet is. Uh, and then there's a collector block over here where we can collect the ions that we've, we've, we've basically separated out in the magnet. I should point out this thing down here is the, is the pump, uh, which every time we, we open up this end of the mass spectrometer, we, uh, we, we add lots of air into the system. And that is bad because mass spectrometers tend to work at a high vacuum. So every time we open this up the system, we need to pump out all of the air before we can measure anything. Okay? And this system over here, so this is, a, this is a thermal imaging camera. So we use this, so this basically looks through to the, to the filament as it heats up to enable us to measure the temperature of our filament as we're, as we're heating it up so we can monitor the, um, the ionization. And this is just an example of the kind of data that this, this, this technique produces. So this is, these are some, uh, some data from a volcano in Italy, uh, in Naples, looking at uh, the strontium isotopes and the neodymium isotopes of, um, of crystals that are precipitated, well, precipitated, that are crystallized in, in the magma uh, from a number of different eruptions. And what this study is doing is basically trying to, trying to tease apart uh, the different sources of uh, magma into the system um, that are responsible for kind of each eruption. Okay, and you can see that we do get a spread of values that have got different isotope ratios. But to see the differences between can maybe one source and another in between, maybe these, these black points and these red points, we do need to be able to see very small differences in isotope ratio. Okay. Uh, and thermal ionization is very good for this because it provides a very stable source. So our isotope, our iron beam, sorry, is not fluctuating in intensity up and down. So that enables us to, to measure very, very precise isotope ratios. And again, we'll come across uh, this and how this, um, in more detail of this in the data processing video. Okay, so moving on to another type of ionization. This is plasma ionization. So quite often called ICP or inductively coupled plasma ionization. So plasma is kind of like a, a fourth state of matter where it's uh, kind of a, a fluid or a gas of, uh, rather than being of atoms or molecules, it's a, a mixture of ions and electrons. Okay, so it's quite a high energy state, okay, because you need to have a, a lot of energy to maintain this kind of like mixture of, of, of ions which would usually want to combine and neutralize each other. So this, this happens in very high energy environments like in lightning or in... Uh, uh, when cosmic, well, cosmic, these are kind of like um, the, the solar wind interacts with the Earth's uh, upper atmosphere. So these are very high energy environments. And you can see that the, the atmosphere here is ionized. We have a plasma. And the, the actual kind of like the bright stuff of lightning, that is a plasma of, of air. 
Um, but in, in our mass spectrometer source, we have this thing called an inductively coupled plasma. Uh, and this is usually, although not always, um, uh, uh, an argon plasma. So we basically have a flow of argon gas that comes down this, this glass tube. And then there's this, this, there's this metal coil here through which uh, uh, an alternating um, electromagnetic, uh, an alternating current is passed, which creates a very strong alternating electromagnetic field. Okay, and this is at uh, radio frequency. Okay, and this works in the very similar way to a microwave. So in a microwave, you have a microwave radiate electromagnetic radi radiation, which interacts with water in your food. And I think this is some kind of butternut squash or something like that. And someone's put it in the microwave, and the microwaves have have, have have caused the water molecules in the squash to, to vibrate, and that vibration has caused the temperature to rise, uh, and then ultimately the squash has exploded. Um, and that is similar to what happens in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in this plasma here, is, is that the alternating, in this case, radio frequency field causes the um, atoms of argon to oscillate, uh, uh, and that raises the temperature, and as the temperature increases, uh, so in this case, the temperature is uh, almost 6,000 Kelvin, so this is as hot as the, the surface of the sun. Um, this causes, uh, this extreme high temperature causes almost, well, causes everything in this region to be ionized. Okay, And then what happens is this tube in the middle here, we basically spray uh, a mixture of gas and sample particles, so an aerosol of samples, uh, into this region here, and that causes our samples to be ionized. Okay, so this is this is essentially the, the, the step through of what, what happens with plasma ionization. So we might have a, a set of samples that are dissolved in kind of little diff different vials with you know, maybe acid or water. Okay, and our sample gets sucked up through a tube. This is kind of a cartoon of that. Through some pump, perhaps, or, or naturally aspirated. And it basically goes to this device here, which is shown down here, which is a, a nebulizer. And this basically just works by spraying uh, our, our sample into a, into a fine mist. And this basically works in the same way as a, a kind of perfume spray. We have a, a high flow of uh, an inert gas that basically sprays over the top of a tube that contains our sample, and that causes it to be broken up into lots of these droplets. Okay, So some quite often there are, there are too many droplets here to introduce into the plasma, because if you, if you spray lots of water into this, this thing, it tends to, to blow it out. So what we do is we remove the largest droplets in a device something like this, which is a spray chamber, which basically the large droplets kind of hit the side of this glass thing and then, then basically get drained away. So we end up introducing a very fine aerosol into our sample. And this is the, the, this is the, the glass tube, it's often referred to as a torch, that, uh, that, that, um, that the plasma basically exists in. So on the outside, it's basically a number of tubes inside each other. So on the outside tube, we, we pass a very high flow of gas because we don't want this plasma, which is at 6,000 Kelvin, to touch the sides of the glass because it would instantly melt. Um, and then through the middle tube, we pass a flow of argon gas that uh, is slightly slower uh, and hangs around long enough to be ionized and form this plasma. And then in the very central tube, we pass this spray of, um, of our sample. So this is, uh, this is a schematic of that thing. So we have maybe a, something that's producing uh, a spray of, uh, or an aerosol of samples, and that can either be this, this aerosol spray or can be anything that produces uh, basically a very fine aerosol of particles in a, in a stream of gas. So we'll show later that this, this doesn't have to be a liquid sample. It can be something introduced from a, a laser system. And this is our, uh, where the plasma happens. Okay, so this, these dots here represent that coil that's producing the radio frequency, um, electromagnetic radiation. And this is where the plasma happens. And all of this is at extremely high temperature and atmospheric pressure. And our mass spectrometer over here is at a very, very high vacuum. Okay, so what we need to do is somehow get our ionized samples inside this thing without uh, allowing lots and lots of air in. And the way we do that is by a series of very small holes in our mass spectrometer, usually in something that's cone-shaped. Um, and then we have very, very big, um, or very, very efficient, not necessarily big, uh, vacuum pumps that, that basically maintain a gradient of pressure from um, outside the mass spectrometer to inside the mass spectrometer. 
lots of different kind of vacuum pumps. And they help suck the ions into the mass spectrometer. And also these, um, these cone shaped things with a hole in the middle of them, they're also uh, held at a high voltage. So this also accelerates the ions into the mass spectrometer where they can be discriminated. In this case, this is a quadrupole discriminator, but it could go into uh, a magnetic sector um, discriminator as well. Okay, so this, this type of ionization is very, very efficient because it works at extremely high temperatures, um, much higher temperatures than thermal ionization. Uh, so this means that it's very good for ionizing elements that are very hard to ionize. Okay, so some of these ones with very high ionization potentials, which means that it's suitable for measuring almost the whole periodic table. Okay, uh, the efficiency of ionization means that it's actually relatively insensitive to the matrix, so you can have you don't have to separate out uh, your um, element that you're interested in from all of the other elements. Uh, we can use a wide range of samples and sample introduction systems. Um, so some of the disadvantages is actually some of the the, the signal that you get out of this uh, because it's basically uh, a constantly flowing gas. Uh, some of the signal in intensity can sometimes go up and down a little bit through time. Okay, so uh, it's not as good as um, thermal ionization in for quite a lot of cases for measuring very very precise isotope ratios. Uh, that's that's becoming. Um, Less of, less of the case um, with, few, with current developments, but um, uh, there are some elements we can't measure, okay, so elements that are in the atmosphere, uh, we can't use this, this type of machine to measure, so we can't use this to measure argon, to measure krypton, uh, because it is open to the atmosphere at this end, okay. Uh, and one of the, one of the nice, things, nice things about this is because we don't need to, to pump down the mass spectrometer every time we take a sample in and out, uh, we can we can we can have a very high sample throughput, so we can measure many samples in a, in a in a day using this technique. So this is an example of 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 one of the things that we can potentially do with this type of mass spectrometer. So this is a this is a plasma ionization source mass spectrometer that we have in the, in the Grant Institute here in in Edinburgh, and this is an example of of, of measuring, say, for instance, these are some uh, diatoms, which are kind of silica based. Um, uh, marine plankton and we can use a machine like this to measure the isotopes of silicon in these things by dissolving up uh, all of the uh, the diatoms into a solution of um, silicic acid and that allows us to then we can introduce that into by spraying it into the mass spectrometer here we can measure the isotopes of silicon and in this case this is some kind of useful proxy for past nutrient utilization Okay, and we can see, so this is depth in a sediment core, so this is kind of like back in time, uh, and variously uh, the isotope ratio will tell us about how much of that nutrient has been utilised um, through time. And we'll cover that in uh, the stable isotope lecture. Okay, another kind of good example of, of use of plasma ionisation uh, mass spectrometry is um, uranium thorium dating. So this is some work that I do, but um, if we measure the thorium to uranium ratio and the uranium isotope ratio of coral samples, uh, they should start at zero age here and then they'll follow this line along here as they get older. Okay, and the details of this kind of are explained in this equation down here, it's not so relevant for the mass spectrometry, but it does mean that if we can measure this ratio and this ratio, we'll plot somewhere on this diagram here, we can work out the age of our sample. Okay, and this is plasma ionization is, is quite good for this because if you look at the, the ratio we're trying to measure, one of them is a ratio of two different elements, one of which thorium is quite hard to ionize, uranium is a little bit easier. So it actually um, is quite good to measure this on a plasma ionization mass spectrometer because uh, it's measuring both of these different elements is, 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 is easily possible. Uh, uh, and the other thing, so this is, this is a paper uh, that's used this, this technique of measuring the age of, of fossil corals using plasma ionization mass spectrometry. And you can see what they've done here is there are lots and lots of samples measured for their age and the, the elevation that they were found above, or in this case below sea level, and you plot those up and they show you where sea level was in the past. Okay? But the key thing I'm trying to point I'm trying to make here is that to do this you need to measure a lot of samples. Okay? Um, so the advantage of using a plasma ionization source here is that it enables you to measure many, many samples 
uh, rapidly, which allows you to build up large data sets to enable you to constrain better the position of sea level through time. Okay, so while we've been talking about inductively coupled plasma, I thought I'd just quickly measure, mention that one of the ways of introducing the sample rather than dissolving up your sample and spraying it into the plasma is that you can, you can use laser ablation. So if you've got a, a, a solid sample and you want to, to, to analyze different parts of the sample, either in some sort of thin section like this, or you wanted to actually analyze different chambers of a foram, okay, you can use a, a, a laser so basically blast away holes in your sample and actually what happens is you actually form a very small plasma and that uh, causes the, the sample basically to, to, to evaporate uh, and form uh, a very, very high temperature gas of your sample and then almost instantaneously just above the sample that gas will condense out into uh, basically some, some dust of your sample. So some very, very small uh, aerosol particles and they ha that happens in a, in, a, in, a, in a small chamber underneath your laser, and then you basically blow that aerosol along a tube and into the, into the, the plasma proper, uh, and then that re-ionizes that uh, sample for it can go into the, into the mass spectrometer. Okay, so this is quite useful if you want to get geochemical information on a spatial scale. So you want to measure, for instance, a profile along um, a mineral, and this is what uh, some authors have done here uh, on a volcano from Central America. I think maybe Costa Rica. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the key thing is, so these are some, I think, olivine grains. And what they've done is, rather than dissolve up the whole olivine grain and measure its, its chemistry, they've used a laser to measure profiles. So each of these little bars along here, okay, is an individual measurement of the nickel content and the iron content of that olivine, okay, um, or oh, actually the magnesium content, the iron to magnesium ratio, shall we say. Um, and as you can see that the olivines are not chemically homogeneous, okay, so the, the center of the olivines have got a higher nickel content and a, and a higher forced to right content than the outside. Okay, and this is quite useful because this tells us something about the magma composition as these crystals have been have been growing. Okay, which tells us something about what the conditions are like in the magma chamber underneath the volcano. So finally, at, um, now we've we've mentioned that sometimes that that getting rather than dissolving up the whole sample, um, sometimes getting spatial information is kind of useful. Um, we're talking about secondary iron. Uh, mass spectrometry, sometimes called iron microprobe. So this is these are some of the instruments that are down in the basement in um, in the Grant Institute. And this this is this is a very powerful technique that allows us to get this spatially resolved scale, uh, spatially resolved geochemical information at very very small scales. So down to down to almost one micrometer. So uh, rather than a laser blasting the sample and then that being extracted into the mass spectrometer, what happens is if we have something that produces a beam of ions, and that is usually either cesium ions or oxygen ions, and those ions hit the sample. And because there's a very high energy of these ions coming in here and the ions are ionized, they hit the, the surface of the sample and start to sputter off or ablate away uh, ions from the atoms from the surface of the iron, atoms from the surface of the sample, which are then ionized because of all of the the kind of basically the ionization potential of the incoming beam and the energy of the basically the impact. So these this basically cloud of ions just above the sample are then extracted by uh, an electric field into some kind of mass spectrometer, and this is a time of flight mass spectrometer diagram here, but it could quite easily be a magnetic sector mass spectrometer, as is the case in the ones down in the in the Grants Institute. So this is quite neat because this allows us for every kind of like tiny little spot in our sample, we could measure uh, all of the different elements or a range of different isotopes at that spot. Um, we can actually move the position of this spot around or move the sample around uh, to produce a map of elemental or isotopic composition. Uh, and sometimes, particularly in material science, what's used, if you just keep this iron beam in the same place over time, eventually it works its way down through the sample, so we can get very, very um, small spatial scale depth profiles through samples. Okay.
So this is this is um, this is quite a uh, a good technique because it has uh, you can measure almost all elements um, as well as their isotope ratios. Okay, not always at the same time. So you, um, uh, it has extremely low detection limits. So this is a technique that's very similar to the electron microprobe or SEM, um, but it has much much lower detection limits. Okay, so it's much better for measuring trace elements, uh, and it also so can measure the isotope ratios. Okay, so some of the disadvantages is it's, it's quite time consuming, it's very expensive, um, all your samples must be prepared, so this, the sample, is perfectly flat, uh, because the sample actually forms part of the mass spectrometer. Um, and I guess I probably should mention this, and this is probably the same for all uh, geochemical techniques, that if you want to know the true chemical composition or the true isotope ratio of your samples, that you need to have very, very well characterized standards that you can measure either side or maybe sometimes just before or just after the sample uh, to, to characterize the, the elemental or the isotope fractionation that is caused by the mass spectrometer itself. So the, the isotope ratio or the elemental composition that you actually measure is not necessarily the true measure of the sample. So you need to measure a sample that you know, or a standard that you know what the chemical composition or the isotope composition is first, so that you can essentially produce a, a calibration. Okay, so this is, a, this is an example of, of where this SIMS or secondary iron mass spectrometry uh, technique has been used. So this is a, uh, a zircon crystal from um, Australia, and this is one of the oldest uh, things on the Earth. So this is a 4.4 billion year old uh, zircon crystal. Uh, and the, the, the interesting thing is that this is a cathode luminescence kind of falsely colored, I think, uh, image. And you can see that this is the zircon crystal. So the whole thing is the zircon crystal. But inside this, you can see very clearly that there's some, there's some compositional zoning. Okay, you can see that this part of the crystal here clearly grew before the stuff outside it. Okay, and you can see that there are some resorption surfaces, some inclusions perhaps, uh, and then there's this layer on the outside which is very different in composition. So this isn't, it wasn't, the colour difference here isn't real, but it's just been highlighted here that there's this rim on the outside, which is still zircon, but it is different from the inside. So if we, if we dissolved up this whole thing here and measured its uh, uranium lead ratios, okay, we would probably be able to calculate an age from that, but that age would be a mixture of all of the different ages of all of the different parts of this crystal that grew at different times. So what the authors have done here is that they've used a, a, an iron microprobe and they've measured uh, different spots in different places of this crystal. Okay, And you might just be able to make out that the ones on the outside, these ones are 3.391, uh, 3.43, 3.2, um, these are younger than some of the ages in the middle, which is 3.38, oh, sorry, 4.382, 4.374, 4.365, so 4.4 billion years. They've also measured some oxygen isotopes using SIMS on this as well to, tell, to try and find out something about the conditions in which the zircon formed. Um, but without this spatially resolved geochemical technique, we wouldn't be able to resolve these two different phases of growth. So there's a phase of growth up here at about 4.4 billion years, and a phase of growth down here at 3.4. And you can see that some, there's been some lead loss as well, okay, on this on this outer layer, which I guess will be covered in Jeff's lecture on uh, on lead isotopes. Uh, but if we'd have if we'd have just measured the whole thing, we'd have probably got an age somewhere around here, which would have been not only wrong, it would be completely meaningless. Okay, so by getting spatial information, we can not only find the right age for the oldest part, but we can also find out some additional information about the geological history of this mineral grain. Okay, so hopefully this video has shown you some different examples of uh, where you've got a different geological problem, uh, a different type of sample, you'll need to use different types of mass spectrometer. Okay, so look out for the next video, which will be on data processing.